Hello again, we're now going to do a lecture to follow up on meiosis, but we're going to bring in some other topics as well, like non-disjunction and how meiosis and mitosis are similar and different. So just a review of meiosis. Recall that we started off with, you know, in this simple condition with a one homologous pair of chromosomes. The, the DNA is duplicated during interphase before meiosis even starts. And then when meiosis uh, begins, the first step is meiosis 1, in which the homologous chromosomes are separated. And then you go to meiosis 2, in which the sister chromatids are separate. And recall that we start with a diploid cell. In meiosis 1, we make that diploid cell become a haploid cell, even though it has double the amount of DNA, those sister chromatids. And then we separate the sister chromatids, still having a haploid cell. Uh, we just have four haploid cells that resulted from the one um, initial diploid cell. And that's how we make gametes, right? Those are eggs and sperm. Also recall that we talked about independent assortment of chromosomes, that it doesn't matter which way these chromosomes line up, whether it's red on one side or blue on the other side or red or blue or blue or red. It doesn't matter. It's kind of a random process. And so you can end up with lots of different gametic combinations. We also referred to crossing over, which can also lead to more recombinant um, combinations in the chromosome, so more gametic possibilities as well. And I want to just show this, um, this uh, diagram of meiosis as well to remind you that the, f the names of the phases are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and then cytokinesis. And in, in uh, normal meiosis, the, during that metaphase one, um, in going in through the anaphase, or when you have those crossing over events, and so you get chromosomes that start to swap tips. And then we also, in meiosis II, also use the same, word, the same names for the phases again, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, going into cytokinesis. But sometimes meiosis goes wrong. So look at this diagram here. What difference can you see from this, these two karyotypes? Remember, a karyotype is a diagram, or well, a, an, an, in this case, it's all of these chromosomes that have been dyed and stained. And so you can actually see them. Then they've been cut apart, come together, so that you the hom homologous pairs are all together. And we've even got numbers um, by the homologous pairs here. There's homologous pair number one, number two, number three, four, and so forth. And what do you notice down here in the 21st pair? Well, over in this karyotype, there are two chromosomes, so those two homologous pairs. But over here, we have three, 21, tw three chromosomes from that 21st pair. So there's three of them. Well, this is what we call a trisomy, because there are three of those chromosomes. <clears throat> and this happens to be trisomy 21, or also known as Down syndrome. And Down syndrome was named after John Langdon Down, and it occurs in about one out of every 700 children born in the US. We also know that the age of the mother has to do with this, that the incidence of Down syndrome increases with the age of the mother. And this is you know, one of the reasons why um, uh, doctors tell women that start to turn you know, 40 or 45, they say, now you know, just be careful or be aware that your chances of having down syndrome have increased because of your age. <clears throat> why would this be? Why do these, and why do these accidents occur? Well, let's come back to meiosis. And we can describe this now as what we are going to talk about as non-junction. Non-junction is when the chromosome pairs fail to separate. So in meiosis one, if you have the homologous pairs of chromosomes, right, with their associated sister chromatids because the genetic material was already duplicated. If they fail to disassociate because the spindle fibers don't connect correctly, they don't pull correctly to the right side, which by the way is one of the main reasons why this occurs more often in, in older women because the spindle fibers don't function as, as well as they did when um, the women were younger <clears throat> and the eggs have been, have, have been there for, for quite a while. And so you have uh, more of these non-disjunction events. But here, they don't disassociate. And so they both go to one side um, during anaphase. And so when you finally create the two new cells it, uh, after cytokinesis, you end up with more chromosomes in one side and less chromosomes in the other side. You eventually follow this through down into the gametes, and you get an n plus 1, so a haploid plus 1 
or a haploid minus one. This can also though happen in meiosis too, where you have non-disjunction of the sister chromatids. And so in this case, half of the gametes would, would still um, be okay, but the other half are going to be the n plus one or n minus one condition. Typically, the, um, the way that we think of this is, so you have an egg cell, or this also could be the sperm cell that has the N plus one condition, but they come together in a fertilization event, and now you have that extra chromosome pair th that, is th that is there, and this can cause major problems. In most chromosomes, except, uh, except for chromosome 21, and there's a few other instances where the autosomes, if you have um, that extra chromosome can still result in a viable offspring, but in most cases, these non-disjunction events are occurring all the time in all chromosomes. So in chromosome number one and chromosome number two, you can have these non-disjunction events. When they occur in those chromosomes, it just results in a non-viable offspring. But there, uh, the case of the sex chromosomes tends to be quite different, where having multiple sex chromosomes either extra Y's or extra X's does not necessarily result in, um, in, uh, in an offspring that is not viable. In fact, they're, they're, they're quite viable. So here are some of the examples that you can have. You can have an XXY. This is, so now this is a, a male, but has an extra X chromosome. And this is also has a name for this syndrome. It's called Kleinfelder syndrome. So it's biologically a male, but there's an extra X there. <clears throat> you can also see that this, um, or the origin of this is meiosis in egg or sperm formation, and so it occurs in the population about one out of every 2,000. You can also, though, have the XYY. This is also known as Jacob's syndrome, but it, it, for the most part, is a normal male. Perhaps they have a few, you know, a little, they produce a little bit more testosterone, so they have a few, bit, a few characteristics that are slightly different but not, not a big deal. Um, also occurs in about one out of every 2,000, and this is due to meiosis non-disjunction events in sperm formation. Metafemales, this is where you have extra Xs. Sometimes this is also referred to as the poly X condition, and that occurs in one out of every 1,000, and then you can have the condition of the, the um, egg that is lacking one of the chromosomes, and so you can actually get an X O or an X nothing else, and that is called Turner syndrome. This is biologically a female, but also has different um, problems. Let's just look at the details of a couple of these. So in Kleinfelder syndrome, a man may have eventually poor beard growth, may develop breasts, and have underdeveloped testes. Whereas a woman with Turner syndrome, remember that was the X O condition, they have this interesting web of skin. Um, they have some heart um, um, morphology that is different, poor breast development, and underdeveloped ovaries. So that um, refers to non-disjunction. So that we've now kind of closed in that discussion of meiosis and what can go wrong in meiosis and how those can call, cause these chromosomal problems that then can result in in either the offspring not being viable or in the offspring um, having some of these disorders. So let's now imagine that you have cut your finger. Okay, you're, I don't know, you're making some soup and you cut your finger. You need to heal the, the cut there and our body has a way of doing that. Or we could also just think about you know, an egg and a sperm that's just come together and it's a one cell and it's inside the mother's uterus and, and there it is, but it now needs to become a full grown baby. Well, what process is going to heal the wound? What process is going to make that zygote grow? This is a different type of cell division. It's still cell division, but it's not cell division that results in the production of gametes. It's cell division that simply just results in more cells that are identical to the parents to the parental cells. And we call this mitosis. So mitosis is cell division where you start off with the one diploid cell. In this case, we're looking at humans with 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. And the end result in mitosis is to have two diploid cells that are exactly the same as the starting um, diploid cell, the parental cell. And we call these parental cells and daughter cells.
In meiosis, recall that we started with a diploid cell, but we ended up with four haploid cells. Now, the, the cell then, as, as it's going through these, these, these cell divisions, it spends most of its time actually in this phase called interphase, where you have a G1 and then you have the S phase, which is where the chromosomes are duplicated. That's, and the S stands for synthesis because we're synthesizing more DNA to duplicate the chromosomes. Then we have our chromosomes duplicated. And then we go through a G2 phase, and finally we get down to the M phase. And in mitosis, this is the mitotic phase. In meiosis, this would be the my meiotic phase. So in mitosis, again, we have the interphase first, which is not part of mitosis, and then we go into mitosis. And once again, the names are very, should sound very familiar. The first phase is called prophase. This is where chromosomes um, condense and they start to arrange themselves. The mitotic spindle begins to form. And in, at the end of prophase, you start to break down the nuclear envelope, and the spindle fibers attach to the centromeres of the chromosomes and start to tug on them back and forth. Going into metaphase, the chromosomes are now all lined up along the midline of the cell, ready to, be, to have those sister chromatids separated. And that's what happens in anaphase where these sister chromatids separate. And at the moment that they separate, we can now refer to these sister chromatids, instead of sister chromatids, we can refer to them as daughter chromosomes. And now they're going to each side of the cell. You then have telophase and cytokinesis. You have that cleavage furrow. You eventually form the nucleus again, and then the chromosomes um, become uncondensed, and then the cell goes back into interphase and does what it needs to do. In plants, <clears throat> this is fairly uh, is very similar with the exception that you've got the cell walls and so you got to deal with a cell wall that's going to divide the cells as well and this is just showing that when you do cytokinesis there's actually these these structures in the cells that are almost like you know my grandma used to make cinnamon rolls and when she would take a cinnamon roll and and uh, divide it instead of using a knife she would put string underneath the cinnamon roll bring the string up and then cross it over and then just pull and the, and that would you know divide one cinnamon roll from the next cinnamon roll and it's something very similar to that is what happens in cells when we need to go through cytokinesis so we can finish off then with a comparison looking at mitosis versus meiosis if we look at the number of daughter cells that were produced, mitosis only makes two, meiosis makes four. The number of chromosomes in the daughter cells, in mitosis it's the same number, but in meiosis we have half the number of uh, total chromosomes because they are now haploid cells. <clears throat> in terms of the similarity of the daughter cells to the parent cells, in mitosis they're identical, but in meiosis, the whole point of meiosis, of making gametes, is to produce variation, so of course they're all different. In mitosis, um, this occurs in all cell types of the bodies, with the exception of the cells in, in, that are going to become the gametes. And in meiosis, this only occurs, meiosis only occurs in those cells that are the sex cells that, that are going to become the gametes. So oh, this only occurs in ovaries and, test, and testes in the body. And again, the function of mitosis is for growth, that zygote becoming an uh, you know, a new individual, or if you cut your finger and you need to repair that, those cells for repair. And for meiosis, the whole purpose and function of meiosis is to produce gametes that again have variation. So that's a, sh a quick comparison of mitosis and meiosis, and also a look at what can go wrong in meiosis when you have these non-disjunction events.